the idyllic villages that cling to our coastline. <laughs> Known for their beauty and serenity. Wow, look at this, just incredible. Now destinations for our leisure. This is like exploring a jungle. But once they played a vital role in our history. That's got to be the lost village. I'm Ben Robinson, and as an archaeologist, I'm fascinated by coastal villages. I love to explore them, discover their histories, and unearth often surprising stories about their past. I've come to the tiny village of Holcombe on the North Norfolk coast. It's 30 miles from Norwich, and it's part of the beautiful 25,000-acre Holcombe estate. quiet place now, I'll discover how one man pushed Holcomb into the spotlight and revolutionised the way we grow our food. People from all over the globe used to come to Holcomb just to discuss crop production, animal production and, yeah, good agricultural practice. And I'll unearth the village's deepest secret. This is a fairly big house. That's utterly remarkable, the first time this has been seen. There's a fascinating story to this village by the sea. Holcomb Estate has a stunning beach, beautiful parkland, a magnificent hall. And for people visiting, it might be all too easy to overlook this little village. But it wasn't always the picturesque coastal settlement we find here today. Holcomb Village is currently home to around 250 people. It lies slightly inland from the sea, but once the tide and salt marshes ran right up to its edge. Its main street is a wide, tree-lined parade that leads straight to the gates of Holcomb Hall, the stately home that's central to the village's history. The village here really is picture perfect. It's an estate village and it's owned by the Cook family. They first bought land here in the 17th century. The remarkable thing is that many of the people who live here still work on the estate or used to work for the estate. All the homes in Holcombe are rented from the estate, which has been owned by the Cook family since 1609. But looking around, the houses are definitely not from that era, and I'm struck by how smart and similar they are. There's a certain uniformity. The same house design is replicated several times. And then there's a common colour scheme. You see that nice light green colour as well. But also, it's the attention to detail. I was just looking at this wall. The coping on here is moulded. It's a lovely fine wall extending right down the street. How many average village streets have walls like this? Oh, and here's a lovely pair of cottages. The uniformity of design there. They've got little gardens out the front, really nicely built. I've noticed a lot of the buildings are using this creamy gold brick. And here you can see it in a band running across the front of the building there. A lot of thought has gone into these buildings. They're meant to look smart and comfortable. Many of the houses seem to have been built in the 1800s. But one on the edge of the village has caught my eye. This building looks very old indeed. See that little window there, that mullioned window with its brick 
hood and you can see it was matched on the other side by another one there was a pair of little windows there right in this gable end and also look at the construction here this gable is built of flint pebbles maybe just beach pebbles they're laid in neat courses and then if you look up towards the apex of the roof there, you can see the flint rubble goes up and up and up and then stops. The whole thing has been heightened and rebuilt in red brick. This older building has clearly been remodelled over different periods of time. And there's further evidence of this. The porch looks like another early part of the building as well. That square hood mould or drip mould, very characteristic of the 16th, 17th century. But the rest of the building, I can tell that's later brickwork. This is all a big 19th century revamp. Nevertheless, the core of the building is certainly early. And as a 17th century building, this is the earliest building in the village I've seen. The ancient house, as this place is known, is now part of the village hotel. But in recent years, it's also been a post office, cafe and art gallery. And there's one space inside which should reveal more about its past. The loft. Well, I've just come up some very narrow, winding stairs, so, but clearly it was meant to be accessible up here. And there's wallpaper on the wall, so it's been a, a room uh, not too long ago. Now, look at this. I think this is one of the original chimney stacks. The brick is smaller, just like the bricks outside, and it looks like it's been plastered over. And then on top, there's newer brick, and here, there's newer brick as well. So that stack has been beefed up to become much taller, much higher, take a greater weight. But I think that could be the original 17th century stack or thereabouts. And this bit of timber here, wow. It looks like this is an original piece of the roof structure and it's just been left here. That's a great survival of the early building. There could have been a house on this site even earlier, back in the 1300s. And I want to know why it significantly predates all the other houses in the village. Holcomb archivist Lucy Purvis is an expert on how the estate has evolved. Lucy, you've got a splendid map out here for me to see, and it looks quite old. Yes, it dates from 1590, uh, so it's just before Sir Edward Cook, the founder of the family, bought the estate. So we've got a fairly grand-looking house here, and there's another reasonably-sized house here, and then a lot of cottages in their own individual plots. It's a fairly typical old medieval village. And then I can see all these routeways off into other villages and towns, so it's a busy little hub. Yes, exactly. There would have been quite a substantial village with all the sort of things that you would necessarily need. So there'd be a brew house, a carpenter's and a blacksmith's working alongside as well. But the striking thing is, the village today doesn't look much like this at all. Well, a later cook, Thomas Cook, the Earl of Leicester, inherited the land. He'd just come back from a very long and extensive tour. He was one of the first sort of tourists of the early 18th century. He was away for six years. He amassed huge amounts of stuff. Uh, paintings, sculptures, manuscripts, and he wanted to create this temple to the arts where the medieval village is. In the 1720s, Thomas Cook commissioned Holcomb Hall. In order to build it, like many aristocrats of the time, he gradually removed the old village seen on the map to ensure he had the perfect garden and views. This practice is known as emparkment. Many of the residents were moved to a smaller settlement on the site of the current village, and the two villages became one. So this map is at the end of Thomas Cook's life. It was made, 1759. And you can see Holcomb Hall, and there's no village. It's completely gone. There are no houses around here at all. Even those fairly grand houses, they've completely gone. They've all moved down, pretty much, down to Holcomb Stade, which we now know as Holcomb Village. And this long one is the ancient house. Amazing. The site of Holcomb's lost village lies partly under the man-made lake. 
and beneath the vast parkland behind the hall. I'm on the hunt for signs of the original buildings that once stood here. Now, looking at those maps indicates to me that we're somewhere in the vicinity of the village that used to be here. Over there, the land has been flattened out for a cricket pitch, and I can't see much on the surface. But here, there's some very, very subtle undulations. But it's so difficult to make out what's happening on the ground. Could this be the location of that lost village? To find out if any evidence survives of the original Holcombe village, archaeologist Rob Evershed is conducting a magnetometer survey. So you've managed to look at a vast area with this very interesting piece of kit. Yes, it's using the uh, Earth's magnetic field and changes in that to tell us what's buried below the ground. So, for example, if you've dug a ditch and then it's slowly infilled, possibly then with some dumped rubbish in there, it will have a different magnetic response to the area around it. And therefore, we can see where that ditch used to be because the fill is slightly different from the surrounding material. As far as we know, this is the first time this land has been surveyed in this fashion with geophysical survey. Any idea from the readings that you've been getting, whether it's responsive, whether we've got stuff under the surface here or not? Looking at the individual results I've going on, I think we may be onto something here. Ooh. So, uh, yes, I think... <laughs> You're making be... a promise there. I can't wait to see what you've got now. Well, let's go and download them and have a look. We know that the grounds were first landscaped in the 1720s, but exactly what was here before? And there we go. Wow. So we're basically looking at the same direction that you've got the, the, the plot here. All this is going on out in front of us here. Absolutely. And we appear to have found uh, evidence for a, a track or a roadway running basically north-south, and then what looks like plots coming off the road, maybe a couple of them. But what's that? Well, that is quite special. It is an absolutely perfect rectangle. I think it has to be structural. And these four bits here are probably pits or post holes. Are we looking at potentially a building with, with two storeys? And how long is this building? It's about eight, nine metres across. OK, so it's, this is a fairly big building. And maybe a large barn or even a, a house with a cross passage. It's absolutely possible. That's got to be the lost village of Holcombe, hasn't it? I think it must be. And this is the first time we've seen it since it was destroyed to make way for the landscape park we see today. Yeah, that's utterly remarkable. The first time this has been seen. That's why I love my job, because we get the first look at to something that's been hidden for hundreds of years. I think it's incredible. In the 1720s, Thomas Cook began to develop existing properties in what was now Holcombe Village. Local tour guide and social historian Keith Harding has studied how Holcombe developed in this time. Keith, there's some really neat, really quite nice cottages here. These would have been pretty comfortable for yeah, people of yeah. the age to live in, wouldn't they? Yeah, when the village started to come to growth in the like, 1760s, 1770s, we had the good fortune that the hall had lots of builders who could then come down and pick up on more work from the estate. And they wanted to show how good they were, and they would often pick up on some really nice designs. And so a lot of the houses that were built were built very smartly. The almshouses is a really good example of that. These almshouses are right at the new entrance gates to Thomas Cook's Great Hall and built by instruction of his wife, Lady Margaret. Originally, it was said that it was for 13 um, uh, pensioners, as they, as they use the term. These are people that have worked for the estate and no longer work for the estate. Uh, yeah, that's right, but, uh, but are being looked after by the estate. And these arms houses were finished in 1757, which is quite interesting because the hall wasn't finished at that point. So it wasn't an afterthought. It was very much part of... Uh, part of the grand yeah. plan. 
And I guess turning this into the main entrance as well, you, you've got your village, you don't want your village to be looking shabby. If you arrive here and you can see a neat functioning village, all Absolutely. the facilities, nice cottages, you're thinking, hmm, these people uh, have, have got some money and they're investing back yeah. into their community. By the mid-1700s, Holcomb Village was starting to develop. It would eventually become a showpiece for this entrance to Thomas Cook's newly commissioned hall. Inspired by his travels overseas, he wanted something similar in style to the magnificent buildings he'd seen in Italy. This is one of the finest examples of Palladian architecture anywhere in the country, and it follows the principles of the Venetian architect, Andrea Palladio. And he was living in the 16th century, but looking back to ancient Rome for inspiration. Now, his ideas were picked up in this country at the end of the 17th century into the 18th century. They were looking for this purity of design, the symmetry of it all, as well as being impressive. Look at that great triangular pediment. It's suspended on these huge Corinthian columns with their foliage there and the capitals at the top. The whole thing looks like the front of a massive Roman temple. In 1759, Thomas Cook died before the hall was completed. The estate passed down to his 21-year-old great-nephew, Thomas William Cook, who developed a passion for farming. The current Earl of Leicester is the fourth great-grandson of Thomas William Cook. Lord Leicester, thanks for uh, talking to me. I'm really interested to hear about this man whose portrait we're standing under. This is Thomas William Cook, and he was certainly regarded as one of the agricultural luminaries of the time. He inherited at quite a young age, and it must be quite a responsibility to think, well, now I've got to, to manage all this. Did he grow up with an interest in farming? Yes, well, I mean, a lot of large estates just owned land and then rented it, rented the farmland to various tenants. Unusually, our family have always had a home farm and have always taken an interest in the land. So, you know, he practised farming himself. Uh, he would go out and, and, and spend time with his shepherds or herdsmen, and I think he enjoyed that sort of thing. And, of course, these are the clothes that he, he would have worn in the countryside from time to time. So he's surrounded by his dogs, he's got a hunting musket, and very much in a country scene, so he clearly must have relished that lifestyle. Absolutely. By the late 1700s, Thomas William Cook's love of farming meant that Holcomb Village found itself at the heart of a revolution. The nation's rapidly expanding population needed to be fed, and existing farming methods couldn't keep up. Growing the same crops in the same fields each year stripped the soil of nutrients. Thomas William Cook started to experiment with new ideas on crop rotation. The system he helped to develop is considered the beginning of modern-day farming. Professor John Martin is an expert on the history of agriculture. So how does this new crop rotation actually work? The Norfolk four-course rotation tended to be a four-year rotation where wheat uh, was followed by turnips. Afterwards, the uh, crop of barley is grown and that's seeded down uh, with either clover uh, or um, grass in order to provide fodder for the livestock. What does that actually do for productivity? Well, it increases it very substantially because if you eliminate the fallow year where you'd left the soil uh, without a crop, uh, you've got more years when, it, when it's growing a crop. More importantly, um, you've got crops which restore the fertility of the soil. For example, turnips are being fed to uh, sheep. Presumably the sheep are eating the, the stuff, <laughs> pooping it out, and you've got ready-made <laughs> manure on yeah, the fields as well. Yeah, in a similar way, uh, when you were growing um, uh, clover, it increased the nitrogen content of the soil. That's quite 
an innovation. These types of cutting-edge farming techniques became part of the agricultural revolution, a national movement using scientific thought to help increase food production. And Thomas William Cook, he's at the centre of things. That's very true. He, he was certainly a, an agricultural pioneer. He becomes one of the iconic figures of the so-called agricultural revolution of the 18th and 19th century. But Cook was really popularising techniques which were already in existence. He organised sheep shearing contests to try and disseminate uh, more productive methods of farming. So he's wanting to share this and say, well, look, this could be for the benefit of the whole nation. Uh, certainly, and he's got a real big incentive to actually encourage his tenant farmers to take up these new, more productive and profitable methods. In the 1790s, Holcomb Village continued to expand, now housing the estate workers who powered this national revolution. Its trailblazing sheep shearing shows were also putting it on the agricultural map. And this huge barn sitting right in the middle of the park was where this popular annual event took place. Well, this is the great barn, and it was designed by Samuel Wyatt. Wyatt was a notable architect. He was designing country houses, townhouses. But here, he's designed this massive barn in a neoclassical style. You can see the triangular pediment there above these huge porches. But it also had to function as a barn, and these huge cart entrances lead to threshing floors. And this is where the grain would be separated from the ears and the stalks. It's absolutely spectacular. Oh, te resucita jina poto sami. Kasaki kono kisiki alita mato. Sapuso zana ika. Debu keri sano kawa. Sota sita sukro saso no. Kusiganiki kusema kawa. Buko basota ba pu pa buka ome wa suna ka koru ga susuki kebe nimika mo kakuku gai pokaki e arus nastato. Holcomb Estate farm manager James Beamish knows more about this special building. Just admiring this great barn, James. Take us right back to its origins. Commissioned in, in 1790 by Cook and built as a working granary and threshing barn, but really built as that centre point for what were his, called his Norfolk shearings at that time. The barn is still very much intact, but where we're standing behind us here, there used to be lots there for livestock. And, you know, agriculturalists from all over the globe used to come to Holcomb really just to discuss crop production, animal production, and, yeah, good agricultural practice. Supposedly, those Norfolk shearings are the forerunners for today's agricultural shows. Amazing. He must have had that in mind when he built this great barn, because it's far grander than it need be. Definitely, you know, it was a certain element of showing off. You know, if we're going to host these people, this is what we've got. And let's take agriculture seriously. You know, it's food production, it's land management. So, yeah, what better than have a, have a venue that really does it justice? I love the fact people would have come here to take a little piece of that Holcomb knowledge back all over the world. 
but also those ideas resonating down through the years as well. Absolutely, and Cook was instrumental in long-term farming systems. He encouraged his tenants to put organic manures on the land to improve the soil, and it's, it's exactly the principles we are using to manage land today. And this great barn was the centre of it all. Thomas William Cook's new farming technique significantly increased his crop production. This created more profit for his own farm and his tenants, and he could buy more land. He needed more labourers to work on his growing estate, so he continued to develop the village. By the 1830s, the population soared as high as 1,100 people. He rebuilt around 40 houses, and his creation was attracting attention nationwide. So this is a report from 1842, and it's by a Mr Twistleton. And he says here, some of the cottages of the Earl of Leicester at Holcombe are perhaps the most substantial and comfortable which are to be seen in any part of England. And if all the English peasantry could be lodged in similar ones, it would be the realisation of a utopia. High praise indeed. And then he says, these cottages are cited as showing what may be done by a landed proprietor who takes a great pride in his good cottages and farms, as others do in fine hunters and racehorses. The cooks are certainly putting effort into creating the perfect village. This is a great example of one of the smartly built homes that would have housed a vital estate worker, from woodsmen to farm labourers to shopkeepers. And this tradition carries on today. Mark Morell is head gardener at Holcombe and has rented this house for four years. Mark, I was admiring your house here. Absolutely beautiful and nice big windows, I mean, obviously flourishes of decoration and so forth. What's it like to live in? It's great. As a family living here with two small kids, really lovely, big, airy, light rooms. So it's easy for work. You know, if I want to walk down to the walled garden, it's a sort of brisk 15, 20 minute walk on a nice day. And that's just how it was in the past. You didn't want people to spend a long time getting to work. Back in the day, they would have had to walk out into the fields or hitch a ride on a cart, and that would take time out of the working day. So living close to where you worked was, was important. And I noticed your house is slightly later than many of the houses here, tail end of the 19th century, something like that. That's right. So 1882, um, this pair of cottages were built um, to house teachers for the school that's just ad adjacent to us. So we've got a school there built in mid-19th century and then effectively a village hall, a, a reading room, very ornate building there built as well. That's really crucial. They're not just building cottages and houses for people, but the infrastructure of a, of a proper village. And hopefully with that you breed the next generation of people who will work on the estate as well. The Cooks successfully created a beautiful and comfortable estate village for their workers to live in, and the estate is still helping to lead the way in land management techniques. Head of Conservation Jake Fines oversees the experimental environmental projects at Holcombe, including natural improvements to farm land. Jake, how does it feel to be part of this long history of managing the landscape here, right back to Thomas William Cook and before. I feel immensely proud that I can be part of the history of Holcombe. Holcombe is ever challenging itself. It's also trying to inform and influence others, something that it did 200 years ago by bringing farmers from around the world to look at best practice. And hopefully Holcombe is still carrying on that legacy for the future generations.
if you're lucky enough to visit this part of Norfolk and come to take in the grandeur of Holcombe Hall. Also, think about the village, because the ambition of the cooks relied upon their tenants and villagers to carry out work in the fields. Now, they didn't know it at the time, but they were playing an important part in our nation's history, and in many ways, they helped to revolutionise the way we live. From the country to the seaside, the search is on for Wales's home of the year. Press red to watch now on BBC iPlayer. Protecting your patch from the harsh grip of the season, Beechgrove Gardens in winter, next on BBC Two.